Okay, so we are at Lake St. Clair with Dr. Dave Sonata and his students from Central Michigan University. And I'll let Dave explain what we're doing here and where we are. You can see he's in the water. Yes, I'm in the water with my wetsuit. It's a little brisk this morning, but uh, I'll warm up with the wetsuit on. Um, so we are on Lake St. Clair. We're in uh, one of the bays of the St. Clair Delta. So we're on the north side of the lake. Uh, way off in the distance is Detroit. Uh, there's been extensive work on, uh, on zebra mussels and native mussel uh, interactions the, over the last 25 years in this lake. This is kind of ground zero for where, uh, where zebra mussels first invaded North America. And uh, one of the things that we noticed is that zebra mussels had a very negative impact on, on native bivalve biodiversity. work found they noticed the decline they monitored it very closely and uh, my master's work at the University of Guelph uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s I, I found what we call refuge sites in uh, some of these very shallow water areas I'm only a little over waist deep in water here Lake St. Clair is actually a naturally very shallow lake it's about 20 uh, 20 feet six meters deep or so at its maximum natural depth uh, but Vast areas of it are hardly deeper than what I'm standing on right now, especially up in the delta. So I hypothesize that some of these areas might have uh, served as refuges back in the late 90s. We came out and investigated, and we found a lot of mussels. And, uh, whereas the rest of the lake and the deeper waters, everything has been excavated. Um, we found in this particular bay uh, up to 12 species of mussels, native mussels. Uh, with some zebra mussel infestation, it wasn't uh, extraordinarily heavy. Uh, continued monitoring through the early 2000s, uh, the last time that these sites have been visited was in 2003. And we were concerned that these, they're, they're very low density, the, the native mussels, there are some, quite a lot of zebra mussels still around. We were concerned that they, they might not be able to sustain themselves for the long term. So we're interested in uh, determining if, if they're still here, are their densities changing, increasing, decreasing, or the zebra mussel levels, uh, infestation rates increasing or decreasing. Uh, and then also, uh, because I'm a molecular ecologist, looking at gene flow between the uh, refuge sites, because this is a large area, seeing if there's gene flow among the sites and to the nearby uh, river systems uh, in, the, in the nearby areas. Around the so the sampling strategy here, you've got these uh, four meter long circle plots and how are they spread out? Like how are you deciding where to, to do them? Just wherever you find a mussel? So what we do is we, we initially find a mussel because they are so sparse and uh, the density is rather low. We, uh, we use, what we're doing is kind of an, it's an adaptive sampling strategy rather than a random search. Mm -hmm. We initially find a mussel and we put these three bar stakes down and then this four and a half meter long rope is attached to the diver or the snorkeler, and then the uh, and then the rebar, and then we we know the radius of that. We can figure out the total area searched, and we can get an idea of the density around that initial one that's found. So it's a, it's a slightly elevated overall density, but it's uh, it gives us a, an idea of density. We can then compare those um, these one site to the next, at least within the within the bays and so on, uh, and get an, and, and compare historically because this is the way it was done. Uh, Years and I believe there's a time component too in some of these sampling strategies. Yeah, if we don't find a, a mussel for uh, for 15 minutes or three quarters of an hour total search time of the, the first an hour that we're that we're looking, then we uh, uh, we kind of abandon that site uh, because the densities are still too much of anything with it. This is an example of what you see when you're just visually searching. I'll dip under here and let you take a look. Now there's probably one of the highest densities of zebra mussels attached to the scene. That's not covering the whole thing, but they're jam-packed on there. Yeah. 
you tend to aggregate on the posterior end of the muscle because this entire area that's clear is buried in the sand. Right. This area is exposed, and this is where the siphons are for the, uh, so for the can, native muscle. So you can see why it would have a huge impact on yeah. their feeding ability. It's basically attaching to the one spot they need to have exposed. So, Tom here is going to have to count uh, the number of zebra and quagga muscles attached to that native muscle. So, And then generally you just pull them off so that you can measure the size of the actual muscle of interest, I guess. 37. 37. 37 zebra muscles on that single native muscle. A zebra muscles are not attaching just to living substrate like other muscles. They actually will also attach to rocks or pretty much anything they can. And this is one that I just came across, and you can see, if you look closely, there's a rock in there. Otherwise, it's just a conglomerate of zebra mussels attached to it. A, a grouping of zebra mussels and quagga mussels is called a druse. A druse. This is a druse of zebra mussels on a rock. <laughs> so just to give you a sense of the paucity of mussels, even in this site, which is one of the better ones so far today, uh, one of the students is snorkeling way out there. There's Dr. Sonata and another snorkeling student who has just finished a circle plot. And way off over there is the boat where we began. And thus far we found perhaps ten mussels or so, I would say at most, in all of this uh, area. Ten native mussels, that's to say. We found probably uh, a hundred zebra mussels quite easily. One of the things we've noticed that I've noticed uh, since being here is just how different the diversity and abundance of mussels is in different areas that are not very far apart. I mean, we're on the boat for 15 minutes, come to a different site, and, um, you know, vast differences in the abundance of mussels and the number of different species. And also the, the species themselves differ. So this eastern pond mussel, we haven't seen I haven't seen the other sites, and now we just picked up about five of them here uh, in a very short period of time. The other thing we're noticing in this area is there are almost no zebra mussels on any of the native mussels that we're finding. Even on some of the older shells or rocks that I've seen, no zebra mussels in this area. So this is within the same lake, in fact, same part of the lake, essentially, um, very close together, and yet quite different in terms of the diversity of native mussels and the abundance of zebra mussels that are attached to them. So, you know, lake to lake can vary a lot, and certainly 